But anyway, Arthi, welcome this morning. I know you look much better. You only had a half a Red Bull this morning. Three quarters. Oh, three quarters. <laughs> That's a big change for us yeah. this morning. He'll, he won't come across as so shaky this morning in his conversation. 100%. But we're also so privileged this morning and a very personal one to us this morning to have Louis Alberts here with us. Um, welcome to the Human Golf Show, Louis. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me. And thank you for taking the time. I am excited about this one. I think there's a lot of people that follow you and relate to you. And you've had a great kickoff. I mean, people don't realize that you haven't been on the tour for that long. You've only right. been a professional golfer for a very a short time. Also, you had a very late start in your career. So over to you. Tell us a little bit about you, Louis, where it's all come from and, and where you are today. Well, mainly my dad um, from a young age. But I was a normal kid, played all sports, motorbikes, cricket, rugby, golf. Most of our holidays were probably on the golf course or and Amir mostly. But yeah, growing up until 18 years old, everything was pretty normal except golf just had that little bit of a standout. And then arrived in Pretoria, um, where I met my team. And to, to this day, they're still the same team, um, which is great. But yeah, lots of ups and downs through, what's it now, seven or so years. Um, yeah, ups and downs. But I pretty much grew from year one to where I'm now. Uh, you know, you even if it's a little climb, it was a climb every year. And yeah, very fortunate to be where I am and thankful for everyone that's been on the road. And yeah, but yeah, from a small town in Dundee to where I am now, yeah, it's great. I can't complain. And hopefully some big things to come. So seven years, but you've only been a pro since 2019 or 18? 2018, I think I was 21 years old. Okay, you turned. To school, yeah. And then seven years in total, you've been playing golf. No, just after school where it kind of became, you know, my main priority. That's okay. pretty much what we did. At school, I played for the school and so forth, but I went to class. Of, I didn't do homeschooling or anything, and I played rugby up until matric and stuff like that, yeah. We know once the bug of golf catches you, it catches you, whether you're an amateur yeah. or pro, but what was that switch in your mind that it was golf? I don't know. It's not, it's not really a switch. It's just like a love for the game, probably. Love for the game. I think my dad also of maybe loves it more than I did and that just kind of grew and grew since a young age it just stood out from the beginning it's not really something you can like push on a person or it just comes naturally which was probably a bonding thing with your dad yeah and yeah. my brother my mm -hmm. brother also played since young and we loved it and our holidays were you know at a golf course playing I don't know junior golf or whatever yeah and it was great and my dad definitely you know pushed it on us a bit when we were younger but yeah, no regrets now. Ignited the flame a little bit. Mm. And what was your talent as you started playing? What what part of the game is really came natural to you? Probably very. I was, I was like a, you know, I didn't do anything like the right way. I, I swung it really weirdly at school, hit like these massive draws. I don't know. It's kind of just like learning how to play the game the way you wanted to, I guess, from a young age, playing on. You know, Dundee and those type of golf courses aren't the best. So you just have to kind of make it work. You know, didn't have proper coaching and stuff like that. So I think you learn a lot about the game if you move away from, you know, do, doing things by the book, I guess. And now, you know, the book and how you learn to play golf kind of combine, maybe quite a good thing. And what's that skill, if I have to take a step back, what would you say do you rate the most? Your irons, your short game, putting, driver, what's your stability? <sighs> I would want to say my putting and, uh, you know, I try to work on it to be my putting because that is just the name of the game. Uh, if you, you know, that's how you make cuts. That's how you win. That's how you save a bad round. That's, you know, it just comes into play the majority of the time. And my coach is obviously very good at the putting part of the game. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. And that has helped me over the last years. Yeah. And tell us, so your support structure around you that you say has been there from day one. Um, we were just speaking about management companies, and we'll get into that now. But what does that sports structure look like? I also know that you recently, in May last year, got married to Claudia. Engaged. 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 My apologies. So uh -huh. you're not there at the married yet. You can see it in your face. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, and what has that changed? Has that changed anything for you? I think so, definitely. I think um, being a little bit more grounded and your priorities lie in good areas. 
And um, my coaching, you know, Emil Steinman, um, he's been there since, well, since I arrived in Pretoria, so that's about seven or eight years now. Um, Theo Bazadino has been there for, for the whole period of time as well. Gavin Groves, you know, started the first four years or so, and then we reunited again. And then obviously my parents and my brother and family are so very supportive and love the game. Um, and then obviously Claudia. When I met her, I think we met her um, the weekend of the World Cup final in Neisner. It's actually, but her brother played the tournament as well, and we both Jonathan. Missed, yeah, Jonathan. And we both met the cut, and then that's actually where I met her. So we had place to meet. You know, we're from different places and different circumstances, but everything happens for a reason. And um, yeah, she moved to Joburg about four months ago, and um, no, it's been great. She's very supportive. She's very understanding of the game through her brother, I guess, which is great because, you know, this game can get a bit tricky. You know, you're never at home. Even if you play badly, you know, even if I don't want to, I might be a bit grumpy. And But, no, uh, yeah, I'm very thankful for the people around me. And um, I'm pretty sure they'll stick around for a long time to come. So the idea for us always is to make sure you get to know some of the personalities on the tour. Um, we believe it brings the the fans much closer towards the game, and, and we look at you differently um, when we do have 50 minutes with you on the show, um, and that's a big drive for us. But tell me, what how do you feel about golf at the moment? The, the game, what it's growing, what do you think is helping, and, and what would you like to see more of? I think the game is growing yeah, immensely. Even if you just look at the Sunshine Tour, we've got more tournaments, more prize money. You know, the players have been great. Um, and the players playing abroad are coming back and playing these events, even if they had to start somewhere else. Um, I don't know, maybe Liv did make a little bit of an impact on the bigger scheme of things with the PGA Tour. Everyone like got a bit of a wake-up call and maybe got a little bit too comfortable um, with they were kind of the best and no one's going to beat them. So, yeah, I think if everyone just keeps staying on their toes and focusing on the things that brought us here in the first place, I think everything should be fine. Um, you know, it's not a one-man game. Everyone helps each other. If it's a community buying balls at the pro shop or if it's a pro coming back to play Dimension Data or, I don't know, giving out free tickets or whatever, everything works to the same goal. You know, everyone plays the same sport. Do you think the Sunshine Tour is growing compared <clears throat> to when you started? Yeah, for sure. I think the prize money for sure is bigger. Mm. And the, the tournaments, we got about 30 tournaments a season. Mm. That's a lot. That's a hell of a lot. That's yeah. a lot. Thomas has done a really good job. Yeah. Yeah. With all the new tournaments, um, the link to the Challenge Tour, new European Tour events, prize, fund, prize money is 100%. just... I think the top way. three non-exempt players get a DP card. Yeah, they do. Mm. After every season. Like something like that, that's massive. Yeah. You see, that's the other part of it that we always always forget about. And we always speak so well about the Sunshine Tour because I, I can't imagine being an, an easy management to do. You know, there's political stuff involved. You can't please everyone as well. You can't, please, you can't be everything to everyone, you know. So I think uh, they always probably look back at some of the mistakes they made or things they could have done better. But I think some of the actions that they've taken has really led to an incredible foundation. And it's not just the prize money and the amount of tour, to, to, um, um, the amount of to, tours that gets played, but also like you say, the access to other parts of the world and other tours, they definitely have made big moves on that too. Yeah, mm. it's a feeder tour. It's a, that uh, Sunshine Tour, Greatness starts here. It's, it's not just to try, you know, sound clever or something. Yeah. It really does because uh, the opportunities that they give us are, are there. Yeah. Um, you know, through the challenge, European, even finals day, if you come top, I don't know, 10 or so order of merit, you get final stakes exemptions and you can, there's really a, an, enough opportunities to, if, if you make use of them and yeah. enough good players, enough good tournaments. Uh, Challenge Tour, we've got what, six or seven tournaments. The uh, European Tour, we've got six or seven. We look at Oki, just won the right event and he's a very changed man. Yeah, he's top, he's top 10 on the DP rankings. At the a, yeah, I saw fourth. that, yeah, fourth. It's ridiculous. That's just incredible. That's just, that's amazing. And I think he's been plotting along for so many years, just how many seconds he's had, not, you know, not winning a lot and all of a sudden winning the right tournaments, 
I'm sure his self-belief is just through the roof now and, you know, see you later. But yeah, if you think about sport, where, where else can you make such a big jump in a different sport? Not really. Yeah. You know, golf is, keeps you on your toes permanently, even if it's, you know, your home club, you know, trying to break 80 or something. You, you're very keen to try the next weekend to break that 80. So it doesn't matter what level you're on. It just it tests you the same way. So everybody's got a big dream and then you take on whatever you take on and then hopefully there comes validation with your decision. I think you've certainly had validation in the early start of your career. And especially if I say early start, I'm not referring to the seven years. You've only been a pro since 2018, actually late 2018. But then you've had some great moments already that validates a decision that you've made. Just talk us through some of your most proud moments that you've had so far. Because, yeah, my pro career definitely started quite slow. Um, it was not easy. Um, needed some help, and I just try to see the light in the tunnel. So it was a bit slow. And then, but yeah, obviously, you know, getting the first win was just, yeah, those feelings from being a six year old to then just all gather in 30 seconds. It was, yeah, it was quite unreal. And the win you're referring to Mount is Eskim. the Mount Eskim one. Yeah, and that final nine holes, that's why you practice. That is, yeah, it's 100% why you practice to, to put yourself in a position. Yeah, even yesterday at Daidata, I had maybe not a chance to win, but, you know, the feelings were there, um, you know, with a couple of holes to play. And it doesn't always go your way. You make some mistakes or whatever the case may be. But that's why you practice. And that, yeah, when it came together at Mount Eskim, oh, it was so great. And all the struggles that you had before that kind of just in that day just go away. Um, if I had to ask you, you said in the beginning of your career things were quite slow and, you know, didn't go your way. What do you think was the change from now to then? Was it mental? Was it ability? Was it comfort zone? Did you feel like you didn't belong or you needed to prove yourself? What do you think was the reason behind that? It's a tough one because it's maybe a combination of a few things. But, um, yeah, being new on a tour is never easy. The guys are fucking good and maybe you didn't understand that so quite well because you just came off a period. Maybe, a, you know, top 10 was quite a general thing on the amateur circuit. And then it's not the same thing on the tour. Yeah. Because it is a bit of a difference, but I think time, time is a big one. Time, you know, getting to know yourself more than the tour, I think, is plays a big part. Some people underestimate, you know, they try to emulate things that maybe Rory does well or something. But the fact is, you need to be able to know yourself well. Otherwise, under pressure, you're going to struggle. But if you know yourself well enough, under pressure, you'll know, you know. What you what you need to do? How to react and how to do it? Yeah. Some tee shots under pressure. It's just it's something you can't really teach. It's just something you have to learn over time. And I think that 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 was probably one of the big differences. Is just time getting to know myself, know myself, and then bit of maturity, bit of maturity, yeah, and playing the game a little bit more like I should or well in my own manner and not compared to other people. Mm. And. The mental part of the game, which we are, we all understand, is obviously vitally important because a lot of people go with skill, you know, has the capacity and the skill. But if we look at you over the weekends and and we see maybe you're a dip in the hole or there's a there's a strike that's not so consistent, what goes through your mind and what's your weaknesses when it comes to your mental part of your game? It's a tough one because everyone's obviously differently, men, men, uh, different mentally, or struggle with different things, but. I would say my mentality around golf in general, and especially when it gets a bit uptight, is pretty good. But, you know, being nervous, and then maybe in the past, you know, something happened or, you know, you had a bad experience with nerves or something like that, it does tend to creep in a bit. And then your body does have like this little numbness about it. And you can only test yourself once you're in that situation again. Mm. You can't just practice it. So that, that it gets tough. I know, like even yesterday, coming down the stretch, that last hole with quite a bit of people and so forth, it's, it's, it's not, you can't teach that. It's just, you have to put yourself in that situation and try to remember what you did wrong last time and try, try and make it better. Did you go for it in two? No, I didn't. No, you left, trees. just left of the trees. And then with a bad shot and unlucky together, yeah, I made seven, which was a bit unfortunate. 
I think it was Ryan, fourth or fifth. So that you know, so stuff like that hits hard. But if you can't, if you can't handle disappointments, then you shouldn't be playing this game. Because that's what eighty percent of this game is: is disappointment. And I think the thing is, what people sometimes don't do is learn from their mistakes. They more harp on. You know, I've made a mistake. What did I step back a bit? What did I do wrong? Mm. Try evaluate it and assess it so that the next time you're in that position, you actually thrive or do better. Of course. Because you, know? you kind of just, you know, think about things you lost maybe or whatever the case may be. But yeah, if you don't learn from your mistakes, it's going to be a tough road. And on tour, what is it like? So the weekend at Die Data, let's use it as a reference. So Friday and Saturday, you obviously have the Pro-Am, which is a commitment to all the big sponsors and people get to to play with their favorite people but tell us when you finish around what happens after that and 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 if you don't mind it's a double ended one then also just a bit of what is your preparation like on a daily basis and your routine that you go through well in terms of tournaments every tournament is a bit different die data is definitely up there with one of the better you know catering ones so we get fort we very fortunate you know there's a big tent with with displays of foods and drinks and you know it's on the 18th green at montague so off the round you're obviously just gonna not have alcohol but you know have something to drink have something to eat just take a breather and watch people come in so it's 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 great and then but yeah normal tournaments pretty much the same thing just have something to eat but in terms of my preparation it takes about an hour 20 minutes to warm up and probably an hour 45 minutes to warm down it's more the fact that you know if there was something wrong the day maybe just show yourself that you can actually pull that shot off or hit that shape or whatever the case may be and just body wise just trying to keep your body on a consistent level is about it just to because you're playing four days a week you're playing 30 weeks a year it's not always about you know the next day it's just about some consistency over a long period of time and is there a fun atmosphere or does players really look at each other in a, in a, um, what is it like? Well, certainly I've got a little, we've got a travel group. We actually call ourselves the OGs on the WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, good. It's, we, we, some good mates, different levels, but we come together with a similar goal and we try to keep things as fun as we can. You know, if we stay together, we must say it's, it's quite lucky in the evenings, you know, we just have a laugh and don't talk too much about golf yeah. and. You know, we're still professional about things, but no, it's lucky. If you stay one man, one man band, it, it gets lonely out there. So you need to try to figure out some ways to just enjoy it. Maybe practice rounds is with your mates playing for hundred bucks or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, it gets lonely and it gets long. And if you're away from home and stuff, also you need to try and figure out some ways to, to enjoy it. And yeah, people around you, mates, you know, even if you're playing against them, I don't know, you still have. You know, you're still happy for them and just understand the goal of the sport you're playing. And some of the people on the tour, anybody you look up to? Yeah. You just, we got so many good players out there playing on the European and, and, and PGA Tours. It's so great. And it just gives you that little sense of, you know, if they could do it, you can do you it. You can do it. You know, um, George could see as it's one of my, you know, I, I really enjoy his game. I think he plays his own game so well. I think he un he tr he understands what he does well, and he sticks to that. And I don't and his scheduling is different to others, and I just think he he focuses on himself so well, and he, he's he's reaping the rewards. Mm. Yeah, in a massive way at the moment. Uh, what do you think sets you apart? What sets you apart from some of the guys? Because your finishes, if you look at your stats, you can see you just on that edge the whole time, and it just feels like. You're in that winning circle, you know, you know, moments like yesterday, uh, I saw that too. And it was like, you know, Louis, don't go left. But tell me a little bit about that. And, 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 and what do you think sets you before, apart? Before you answer that, do you think if you had a 45 inch driver, it would have gone straighter? <coughs> no. No, okay. Probably skewer. <laughs> skewer <laughs> probably been 20 more left. So Louis yeah, plays with a 40, 43 inch. Yeah driver which is a three wood shaft in his driver just for everyone to know so and my forward is a five wood length so, mm. yeah my yeah. driver and three wood but sorry i interrupted there a little bit no but no just, not uh, at all just that in there. to see you know what do you yeah. think and would that have made a difference because i mean your natural shape is a little bit of a jaw 
Man, uh, but, identified it. Yeah. But identified. I mean, you've got the draw in you as well. Am I? I do, because I guess, I guess my fade can get a bit big. So my, you know, my practice routine is I draw it to, to, to kind of narrow it down. Okay, so okay. So your dispersion. Okay. I go through phases where I straighter and, and so forth. But yeah, my driver is shorter. And I think La Tristan Lawrence was the first person's driver I hit, which was a fully 43-inch driver. It was one shot, and then I was like, I need this, like, tomorrow. It's it's just so comfortable. The length, I don't know, just made sense, and you don't hit it much shorter. And you playing with what at the moment? They're obviously playing Titleist, but yeah. what are you playing? TSR 2, 8 degree head with a hazardous smoke. Has hazardous Hulk. Hulk, green. Mm. Drafton, I think it's a 70 TX. 70 TX, and my forward is a 80 TX, I think, or same shot. 16 and a half degree head so yeah and they've been yeah it's in my bag for quite a while and irons t100 irons with x100 shafts butter it's a uh, scotty cameron it's a circle t which i'm very fortunate to have and then i don't know the names are coming to me now is it, uh, it's like a little half moon okay it's still a half moon shape no it's been great two years it's... on the bag and i actually won with that same putter so if you've got a good memory of the putter, you just have to stick to it. Yeah, because it's not something people often change, huh? I feel like people that change putters often have got demons. Okay. Could be. Personally, because you're searching for something, sometimes it's good to chop and change. But if you con if you have a constant consistent pattern with your putting, I think you'll be a lot more consistent putter. Mm. If that makes sense. Hundred percent. And I assume Vokey wedges. Yeah. About a 46, 50. 46? Pitching wedge. So okay. Pitching wedge. As a bokeh. Um, 46, 50, 54, and 58. And they have also been... My bag hasn't actually changed for a long time. Um, I think it was just like the 4, 3 wood area where I struggled a bit trying to get something good. I actually changed. Really brought me a driver. I had 4 wood on Tuesday. And I put it straight in the bag, and that's not like me. So at least I think this one... Is yet to stay. Um, why the chat? Why the four wood? Just distance control. Just you know, trying to hit a certain distance. I think the three wood, especially I like it shorter. So you need some glue in the head, and then sometimes the ball just kind of falls out the air. And especially if you pull it, then it can go. It goes way too far. Um, so it's just trying to build something that feels comfortable, and that goes a certain distance without going off the planet. And loft is your friend. I add a bit of loft to the club, it's just going to be a lot easier to hit. I mean, it's just basic, mm. you know. If you've got a 16 and a half degree or an 11 degree, I know it's a big gap, but it's going to be a lot more easier to hit a 16 and a half degree, especially under pressure. You know, yeah. you want a club that under pressure, you don't even have to second guess it. You can pull it and, it, you know, you can just hit it. Yeah. Um, and I see a lot of the guys on tour now, even on the European tour, they're going drive a three wood, five wood, seven wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go back 10 years, you would get tuned that you're a flippin' senior golfer mm -hmm. if you had a seven wood in your bag. But the game is evolving. You know, it's not about what's in your bag and look, people want to make money. They want to be consistent. They want to hit the shots under pressure. Yeah, make it older. a bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll quote John Rahm when he just recently said that, you know, all I keep asking is easier to hit and Goes forgiveness. Further. Oh, and easier to hit the forgiveness. He'll work out the rest. Mm. You know, just keep developing towards that particular goal for him personally now. But then navigating the world of golf, you know, there's so many behind the scenes things that we always know. And hopefully somebody that's listening to this. One, how do you navigate sponsorships? <laughs> it's immensely difficult, to be quite honest. You can you can go out and ask, but it's really difficult. It's, uh, you know, the... Probably the easiest way is about, you know, building relationships rather than, you know, just asking for a sponsorship. And um, obviously your results speak a big deal. Um, but, yeah, I've I've been fortunate to have, you know, good people in my corner that help me in different ways. And, yeah, but, no, I must say on the Sunshine Tour sponsorships is quite a big thing because, you know, the yeah, the ratio between, you know, earnings and expenditure and stuff like that especially if you're a bit older and you have a wife or a kid or something like that it, it, it gets pretty intense 
So if you got some people putting, you know, you know, leaving some strain off your shoulders just to play the game, it does make a massive impact. Um, so yeah, I think sponsorships is a big topic in South Africa, and I think the, the guys that do have some sponsorships, you can definitely see a bit of a difference in freedom. And you know, if you play, if you like every putt you hit or every shot you hit, if you start thinking. You know, what's next week looking like? What's the prize money looking like? What's Mike's flight's going to cost and stuff like that? You know, then it's like very close to impossible to play the game. So sponsorships, no, it is a big deal. And it's always a combination of, you know, it's, yes, equipment, yes, shoes, yes, clothing, but then the hotels don't accept your signed shirt as payment. Uh, and, and, <laughs> the, the, and, the, balls. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. and the airlines, when you call them and say, listen, I'll bring a, I'll bring a Titleist v, v, a 1X through and sign it for you guys, they don't really accept that as payment. Mm. So it's always that struggle between cash and equipment, and you need both in order to make it. Yeah, you do. Uh, there's, you know, everyone says it's a very lonely sport and one man because it's only you hitting the ball. But there's lots of there's lots of factors that help you hitting that ball, and um, you know, sponsors is definitely one of them. Your team is another, and and yeah, unfortunately, there is a lot of it's an expensive sport even from a young age. Some people didn't have as much chance as others because it's just too expensive. And um, I'm very fortunate that my parents were able to give me a good chance at this game. And now, yeah, getting older, it's hard. And then sometimes if in South Africa, it's also hard because, you know, you try and explain to someone, the, you know, what you know what your money's worth, whatever they give you and, and what you can give them. But, you know, with the Sunshine Tour bringing on Supersport and, um, you know, things like this, the yeah. podcasts and, you know, social media and Supersport, if, if you play well and you have some TV time, you know, all those things are very valuable as a player and i feel like things click at the right time you know when you need it the most probably not gonna happen and when you don't really need it then it feels like things come in easier so it's just how the game works what is it roughly i don't want to put you on the spot here but what is the rough cost to be on the tour a year um mainly just golf about four hundred thousand a year that accommodation with flights and everything yeah, probably. and it's not like you you book into a five star resort no, wherever no, you no, go. No, you know no, what I mean? Listen, That's everyone's the everyone's working on budgets here. Yeah. yeah, you know. No, no, you try to stay. You know, without staying on the floor, but without staying a five star hotel, you know, somewhere in the middle there. Yeah, and you know, sometimes you have to hire a car sometimes, and even with that expenditure, you still try and you know, you know, someone here that you can stay with, and you know, this guy, you know, Calston Motor Group gives me. A car when i go to pe for example you know like stuff like that helps but the expenditures is still probably around 400 years so it is expensive and if you make 400 or 500 in the year you you're close to getting top 50 oh, order of merit so the tax man still wants well. yeah so you're playing well so the ratio is a bit tough sometimes without any help now louis just talk to us a little bit because there's a lot of youngsters you, you know if if you if you start a new business or Arthur, you know, a guy goes into the fitting world, I would assume that there's a few things that you think you need to do and know. But then when you start to work, um, you realize that there's different ways. So management companies, just talk me through that at the moment. We just had a conversation off air before the time, but tell me just some of the things you've learned and, and, and where you are currently with that. Yeah, I think management companies is a difficult one. Um, because in certain areas they can obviously help you in certain areas maybe just cost you some money um but yeah I've, I've I've spoken to some of the more senior players and so forth I think you must if if if, if a manager kind of uh, you know asks you or, or there is conversation about something then just maybe take a couple of days and think about it because you know there are contracts in place and you know it can get more complicated it can get more complicated than what you think in the beginning and you know selling dreams to actually receiving stuff is also a bit of a difference um you know if and management companies in my opinion their two main priorities is sponsorships and invites so i would definitely recommend if someone does you know call you up uh, i think the main topics to speak about are definitely those two and then if 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 you do get invites or sponsorships then great then i think it's worth it and if it's not 
then yeah, maybe try you know, pass your you know, pave your own way um, until you get the right person. And a good management company is like you say to have you know, because imitation creates opportunity. Then it comes down to the hard work and what you put in in order to mine that opportunity. Mm. Um, as an example, on average, management companies what do they take from players? What is the cost to deal with them? It's really it, it. It obviously differs. You know, some people do it differently. They maybe only charge you on things that they do, or they just charge you in general. You know, you know, three or five percent per per week uh, per tournament. Um, maybe just the admin fee, um, and then on top of maybe if they get you an invite, you pay more in that specific event. So it, it differs, but it, you know, it's definitely not for free. And um, yeah, it's something that rather chat about it and make sure you're making the right decisions because golf is hard as it is um you want the right people in your corner obviously i think a lot of people also when they get um management groups or companies um when they get approached you know you almost feel like yes you know now yeah. i'm in the right now place in the right you know, place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, they're asking me now yeah, yeah. I'm now i'm moving in the right direction but they don't read the the the, the oh. contract or the fine print um so you see sort of like this is going to help me but what what cost mm. you know from a financial cost um etc because like louis was saying cost you four hundred thousand rand a year on the sunshine tour and you make half a million you know you what top 50 top 40 on the mm. order of merit yeah half a million is going to get you probably top 50 and that's okay you played really well you've had, you've had a good season mm. okay then you get into the next you get into co co sanctions mm. on top 50 i think mm. But you still got to pay the tax man. You've got a hundred grand balance. Yeah. You know, take five percent of four hundred grand. Yeah. Plus the tax man. Yeah. Yeah. It's plus it's so you just need to really, really do the maths and really dive into it. And I think also, I feel with relationships as in general, you know, from business and friends, you know, start small, you know, negotiate something small and say right. This is what we can do together. But let's start small and let's build a career awesome. path together. You know, can't charge a, I'll just use a Jacqueline Hess, what you're going to charge a Sean Norris. Yeah. You get what I'm yeah. saying? No, if you want to get that person to Sean Norris's um, space, yeah. build build a path together, you know. No, it's course. a give and take thing type of a thing. It's a long-term envision. You know, business is long-term, not short-term. 100%. So uh, that's just my two cents. I and think. relationships are important. Correct. But with people that have the same goal. Correct. Correct. And the same value system as well. Yeah. Otherwise, Correct. there's a clash. Like a little family. Yeah. Family is a good word. Um, you know, if you have family around you, um, it, it goes a long way. Yeah. And what I also found in golf is you have to achieve some incredible stuff. But look at some of the biggest golf personalities. They're not the top 10 players currently. But they've won masters they've won an open they've won incredible tournaments that give you access for the rest of your life mm. you know there's a saying if you win a master or an open championship you'll never worry again in your life for anything and if you look at that look at trevor Omoman as an example he just won that position at cbs sports as one of the anchor i mean he's now one of the top two personalities within golf commentating call it behind the scenes whatever you want to that comes a little bit also out of the masters that he won you know the seat that you get hmm. i would go i would go a step back. back i don't think he would have even been in the first seat let's call that the second seat correct if you didn't win the masters yes well it's we you can beg to differ i mean he's a great guy great personality very intelligent knows the game very well yeah, he does. got a good head on his shoulders so um but that opportunity probably arose because of his CV and his link to America winning the awesome. Masters. 100%. You know, that moment was so South African for me when... Um, I'll uh, never forget where I was. Yeah. It was it yeah, felt yeah. like 30 years ago. Yeah. I will re not remember where I was at that time. Listen, if you look at uh, Trevor now, when I mean, you look at the old flashback towards that, it definitely was a different time. But what I found was so amazing at the president, who is obviously the captain of the president um, or the international team, where he, he fixed the divots from the guy standing on the green afterwards. It was such a special moment in golf. Did you see that? I don't know if you saw that. So yeah. after, I don't know if it was after the round, round completely or after the one group passed, because don't, 
don't quote me on this because I don't know what the ruling is. Someone else fixing the marks in play. You get what I'm saying? Mm. But it was when the group left the green, Trevor took his pitchfork and uh, fixed some divots on the green, mm. pitch marks on the green. That's and one. he's the captain. Yeah. yeah. And the main camera switch switch of that was behind the scenes camera that caught him doing that. Correct. So that was he's certainly not, not for any other He's reason. not doing it for any other reason but respect. Yeah, mm. It's definitely respecting. I don't want to talk too much out of it, but I had an opportunity to sit with Johan and June Immelman for dinner mm. while we watched. Literally, that night is when Trevor did his first intro on CBS. And yeah, I said, you know, with the dad. And I mean, you can just imagine the emotion yeah. that came out of both of them. But that's something that Johan stood out for him with his son, where he was so proud. Yeah. You know, and make no mistake, Mark is also making some great impact in golf, golf that side as well. So that's what I always found in golf. You know, yes, it's a it's a hard game, but once you win some of the big ones or or or, or get to that level, you know, golf looks after you also for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, sure. You know, and, I, and and I'm not talking from an experience perspective whatsoever, but certainly just from an amateur standing aside. And you've paid your dues. Yeah, you know? I yeah. feel that you've come you've, a long way. Yeah, a long way to get to where you were. I promise you, it wasn't by default or by fluke mm -mm. or because someone else gave it away you know no, no, gave no. it to you like yes. sign this contract you'll win the masters yeah. it's never gonna happen <laughs> so and i think you've met some great people along the way so if if something does happen to you in like a bad way oh, you, you your circle is big enough by the time you get there mm. and i yeah. mean look at dylan i mean he was chatting when we were chatting to him on the podcast and after you won the johnny walker what's the johnny walker yeah uh, no, John Deere. John Deere, sorry. The John, John Deere, Deere Classic. Classic. We spoke about his um, increase in ball speed and clubhead speed. Mm. So why yeah, did yeah. he do that? Well, I just won a PGA Tour event. Got a two-year exemption. I've got time to work. Oh, yeah. Excellent. You know, and gain speed and give myself the opportunity to get closer to the hole so that I can score better and do some speed um, speed work. So it all, you know, once you've got given that opportunity and paid your dues and won the right tournament, it gives you the opportunity to try to break through to that next level. Even if it takes you a year and a half in your two-year exemption, stick to the process and the plan and get to where you need to do for another 15 years later. Yeah. So, yeah. Those are also things that you can make to differ because he just won the John Deere. So if you can win the John Deere, I'm pretty sure you can win a different tournament for yeah. the same game correct so some people think yeah maybe it's time you know you can use those two years to maybe you know better yourself which is great and i think but on the other hand you also had a great game to win the john Deere. so i think that's why this game is so beautiful in a sense because everyone is so different some people take it like very specifically you know with the technology of today and stuff like that and some people just naturally play the game like i would say louis and sean norris louis and sean and george and those guys are good examples that if they win a tournament up there, they're, gonna, they're, they're still they're gonna not. have their brown vein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and George might just might just do a, a poker, well, not poker, Sneak, what snooker Sneak, tournament yeah. um, at the same time. Yeah, I've played with him a couple of times. Where we talk about those. He's very good. I, I yeah. yeah. He's he's part of like the PCC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Committee or club or something, and he plays like matches against really? other people. Yeah, impressed. Well, it it just shows you because he's a really really good putter. So he knows how to get the ball in the hole. Yeah, I, I tell you, I don't want to talk out of it, but I had to meet him very early at, at Pretoria Country Club the one morning, and I could see he came out of a rough night. Yeah. And then after that, he was just like, uh, Albert, I, I need to go. Huh? The tournament's about to start. So I'm like, what tournament are you, are you talking about? I go, no, no, snooker. The snooker tournament. Uh, yes. <laughs> on a Saturday, good. apparently it's cooking there on a Saturday morning. I would have expected him to get onto the golf course, but it was the snooker tournament. That he was more interested on That's the day. That's interesting. Now, Louis, are you allowed to be yourself on tour? And are you yourself? You know, or do you have to put up a lot of s smiles and, and waving? And what is the, the environment that they create there? Obviously, it depends on personality. Or yeah. I guess if you have a bit of a wild personality, it might, might catch up to you a little bit. But in terms of, no, I think it's actually quite, quite comfortable, quite easy. You know, I'm not a very loud or a very out the box person anyway so i know i get to enjoy myself fully i guess you have to respect the game you have to respect the sunshine tour um you know you are representing a brand yeah so i guess 
especially off the golf course, probably mainly. To you know, I guess you can't do some stupid shit. Yeah, yeah. So that's just facts. But that, I guess, that's just being respectful to people around you, anyway. Yeah. So no, in terms of you know some freedom of being yourself, no, hundred percent. Like my one of my best mates, Any, I think he he's himself fully. The way he dresses, the way he, he is around other people. He's a great example on, you know, how to be yourself. And, um, yeah, I think it's everyone for themselves and how they want to be, I guess. I think for me personally, I'll always judge a character if I had to judge a character based on a period. Okay, so like, for example, with Louis and Henny Duplessis, for example, we've gone back many years together playing golf. And obviously when I'm at events, you know, helping them out, whether they need my service or not. If they come up to me and say, hello, Arthur, how are you doing? Not wanting anything because we've had a relationship or we know of each other or we've, you know, associated together. Just that coming up to me and say, Arthur, how are you doing? Just shows a lot about someone, even though you're playing on the Live Tour, European Tour, PGA Tour, and then you get the other probably 1% of the people that won't, won't do that and mm. just do their own thing and, you know, ex the main man no type of a thing yeah you know it's That's it's the sad. small basic things that is there and it's just saying hello how are you doing lucky to see you yeah. how's things going you know that that for me takes over everything mm. but you have to also be you know amateurs you know in general think about this whether you're watching a movie whether you're watching some documentary attention to keep your attention is important you know um, you can't just say I'm putting on a good show, therefore you have to watch it. It has to be exciting. And just like in anything, all these different personalities creates moments that amateurs like and, and enjoy watching. Mm, because yeah. we have to get the viewership, you know, up. Um, I, I'm not talking from where the stats are or know what the stats are, but ultimately we, all, we always want the most viewers we possibly have because that has a direct effect on sponsorships and uh, 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 how players are highlighted and et cetera. You know, we as amateurs, it's, if it's just going to be the serious game where everybody's serious, nobody really, if it's just this one type of personality that everybody gets conformed them, I think the game will go backwards. Mm. You know, you want these different personalities within golf to shine mm. and, and have its moments. And I even see some of the serious guys when they have that putt in the, the right moment, you know, they get excited, you know. Mm, yeah. Um, and, and to us, that creates excitement because we share that joy with them. We really do, you know, that's the moment where we share that same joy. You know, I saw Kim Comron Smith at the towards the end of last year when he just look at that emotions for the last three holes, you know, and then at the end he pulled it through it at the end. But look at that, you know, to us that's look so genuine and that one you could see that you could see mm. that that's something he was chasing for quite some time mm. and that breakthrough you need in order to continue because just like anything you eventually will get judged to say, oh, okay, well, it's been 12 years or whatever that is. I'm not saying that was Comrade's spit stats. Okay, well, are you going to win something? Are you going to at least top 10, five finish, whatever Very it tough. might be? Very tough because uh, golf can change in a week. We all know that. Yeah. But after a certain period of time, it's, it's hard to do, differentiate where, you know, are you still believing it could happen next week or are you just holding on to something that might not happen? It's very tough uh, to, you know, if you start maybe staggering a little bit and, you know, it's hard. It's hard to, you know, win because you only, you have to back yourself. No, no one else. It's not a team sport. So, you know, it's hard. And, uh, yeah, there are a couple of players that fall on the same boat. Some people, you know, just stop and go and work plainly. And then some people just, you know, carry on. And it could work out of them. You know, it takes some time and then all of a sudden, you win something big and then you just be on a different planet. You're on the first flight to Europe. Yeah, you know, and that's why it's important that professionals, you know, and I'm not saying because their game is to, to play the best they can, mm -hmm. put all the love and effort in because all we see is the beautiful stuff really, you know, not always behind the scenes. But in order to grow the game, there's always a life after the game, you know, whether it be your coach that goes into coaching, sports management, whether it's, um, academies that places you around the world to help out with golf management and, 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 and facilities and etc. If we don't grow, grow the game of golf, you know, there won't be a future for, for professionals to also go into other parts of the game. 
because it's the one thing that I think a lot of people are jealous from from a sports perspective. It's the one sport that you can make money and continue being great at mm. until you're very old. Lots of people do it. Lots of people do it. In any other game, I mean, you're just irrelevant. You know, say let's say out of after your fifties. Yeah. Most games, you know, sure. you have freaks in soccer like forty-one year old. What's his that freak's name? Ronaldo. No, no, no. He's not even there yet. That that guy that with the long hair, man, is Latan. Is Latan forty-one? 41. 41. 41, buddy. He's, he's a beast. I mean, that's the guy that that's comes impressive. into Los, in Los Angeles and then takes out an ad. Zatan, you're welcome. That's the ad he takes out in the when main you, newspaper you, to announce to himself. LA yeah, yeah, to announce himself to the world. And then, and then. Ronaldo's jersey. Sorry, I've got to say this. Yeah. So Zlatan was at Man United and then he was part of the English Premier League. And then one of the um, um, interview guys was saying, so who do you think is the best strikers in the Premier League? And the guy was like Lukaku and, you know, I can't remember the other guys, probably, uh, help me out here, Aguero. And then the guy in the interview said, so why don't you put your name, you know, on that list? He says, um, I don't compare myself to humans. I'm a, I'm a lion. Lions don't compare themselves to humans. <laughs> oh, forgive us, it's you know, a sports show. Let's know one more thing about what he did. So Michael Jordan sends him a signed jersey yeah, to him. Well, he signs it and sends it back to him. That's this guy's <laughs> attitude. And make no mistake, he backs this up. So that's he why he's, that's why he's yeah, such a legend in that field. No, no he's a But Michael Jordan sends you a jersey. You go, oh, I didn't know you wanted a jersey for me. You sign it and send it back to him and say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, that looks a legend. Uh, Louis, sorry for diverse, uh, no, the the going right, there. The personalities are great. That's what personalities for you sure. Know, you be able to yeah, it excites you. Yeah. To watch the sport then. Yeah, and I tell you what, man, and that's why there's something. And I think the Sunshine Tour, not as a tour, but as the players, they need to learn this still, in my opinion, because you know you can say about a lot of these big personalities, but. They have understood somebody like Bryson DeChambeau that started his YouTube channel, you know, that 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 opened up his world to all of us. Make no mistake that that created fans to him in a very different personality. And if you look at Dylan also, Dylan Fratelli invites a lot behind the scenes, you know, he's Jim at his house. And his personality comes through in almost every post that he puts in. Mm. And he doesn't want to be controversial just so that he's controversial sake. He's just the type of guy that says, I know who I am. Um, why must I think exactly what i'm gonna i'm just gonna say and be who i am mm, and you, you like that or you don't like very that raw. you know he's yeah, very raw yeah you know and then when you finish on 14th position you know that just validates like he's not just a guy that that talks he's also mm. a guy that does and, and that and that to us who said uh dylan please make a cut i mean i i just want to but I, I, and, please. and please you must do me a favor you must take his position ending and post it but we left please Pull please pull this club, club pull his, his position onto, onto the, that uh, post onto and, the club and then just add dylan's 14. yeah post, and, and i mean we didn't want to be just difficult for difficult sake but a guy comments like oh a, a guy that says this it doesn't make, make the cuts. cuts you know and we said back to him like show us your purse you know <laughs> show us show us the please. achievements you have because we all By know way, he's some I think, dodgy I think sitting he has 37 followers or something ridiculous as well oh, are you what that guy I probably i think he had like 37 to like Oh, oh, followers the followers. And well. then and he deleted his own comment. When we had people delete their comments mm -hmm. because the people just all of a sudden go, excuse me, who are you? Because there's a time for these for these people online. And 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 it's good that we highlight some of that stuff. It's these days are over. You know what I mean? Shut shut the fuck up in my opinion. Mm. Do it or shut the fuck up. No, I agree. You know what I mean? You have to sit here and be critical and look at this Sancho. And hey, you you're amateurs we get, you know, and I think South Africans think about this. The rugby, rugby and cricket when we grew up, our parents. I mean, there's first fights that break out in South mm. Africa because every parent thinks his son is the best shit yeah. and he's the best, he knows the most. And I'm just saying, listen, if you want to be critical of Louis, go and play that game. Go literally, if you stand next to him and a guy that is on your level, Louis, he would be privately speaking to you and say, Louis, I think you could have been done better there or let me just, that's a private conversation. Now you get these people that come in from the side. Oh, Louis, I would have never hit that thing there. Well, I mean, just mm. shut the fuck up, in my That's opinion. That's hard. You stand, just sit there and type a message. Very easy. Very Listen, easy. Listen, there was Jeez. one. There was uh, one guy that wrote something and then deleted his post, and he went absolutely, absolutely. like off. We, re we we read. I read this, and I was like, 
how do you have the audacity to say something to was someone? A, a comment. It on was a, a comment on the on a post. And then he he actually on the human golf show post on oh. on Instagram. To me, and you know, f forget that guy because I mean, who cares about him? But to me, you know, because you hear these things at the tour, or you hear these things when you know, because I go to a lot of them behind the scenes. And I just want to say to people, I mean, you do your thing, support these guys. It's already challenging to do what they do. Support them, get to know them a little bit, and you know, we always say conscious viewing, and that's really hopefully, Louis, uh, that today will help you know us. To highlight who you are mm, of course there you sit really confident in who you are a great personality and i just want to also say just an absolutely great heart mm. you've always just shown respect to me mm. i was absolutely no one in golf and, and 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 you know arthur comes out of the industry and i'm still absolutely no one in golf but you showed me love and respect from day one that i met you and i will never forget and i always speak about that like, who do you think you are to treat anybody differently if this guy can treat somebody with love and respect? The European tour is where, is where you want to go to. And it, and I always say, we don't say, you're on the Sunshine Tour, it's a time and a place, but you've got a goal to be on the European tour. Are you still in that same mindset? Yeah, of course. Of course. I think there's, with the opportunity Sunshine Tour gives us different routes you can take. But 100%, I think, you know, Sunshine Tour is a good feeder tour for European, and European is a good feeder tour for PGA, and a PGA is a good feeder tour to play the majors, and then yeah. the majors is a good feeder tour to become potentially world number one. I almost thought you were going to go the US PGA Tour is a good feeder for the <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going in that direction. No, yeah. he sorry, knows more about golf than that. For <laughs> but I never looked at it that way. So that's sort of how the golfers also see it, Nee, how each tour feeds each other. So then from the PGA, it's opens and ma majors. Yeah, but and that Sean potentially... Norris and those guys, they went to Asia, Japan. I think Sean Norris, you know, he was, I think he got top 50 mainly just in Japan and Asia. So it's And not top just... 50 gets you onto the PGA Tour okay. in a certain category. Okay. And so you'll be able to then play, and majors, obviously, crucially. Yeah. So you'll play your majors, you'll probably get some starts, some invites on PGA events with not having a card. And they'll give you a certain amount of events yeah. to try because now you're the top 50 in the world. Yeah, mm. one of the best players in the world. Mm. Why not play on our tour? Yeah, so they give you that opportunity to get a couple of invites, play a couple of tournaments, of and then if you make enough money to be top, I think it's 120 something on the order of merit. Then you keep your card, and then you okay. don't have to go through Corn Ferry Tour now. Yes. Yeah. Short vision for you for this year. Just give us a bit of insight. What is your vision board for this year on the tour? Well, the position I'm in right now is I'm 14th on the order of order of merit, which is a great climb. And then I think there's 10 events left. So home stretch with some big events and yeah, quite you know a little bit of a pressure pressure situation, and that's again why you practice. But yeah, I think the two. Co-sanctioned tournaments left the TP, and then a couple with a challenge, and then a couple normal ones. Um, and yeah, obviously we know what you know if you come top ten order of merit after these after the season, what doors can open. So, what doors open up? Because I don't think the people who watch the show would know what doors open so up. Different sometimes, but now I think top three non-exempt players get DP status. May, okay. Might not be the best category, but okay. they get status. And then um, the next three non-exempt get final stage exemption okay to all to all q schools and then there's also second stage exemption for the next three um and then that's obviously your stepping stone so if you come top 10 you've obviously made some good money you can probably support yourself to go to that final stage and you know skipping two stages is already a big hurdle mm. and then yeah if you don't or you can get your card obviously if you don't always get your card you can maybe keep your challenge to a card and then go play challenge to a full season so they do, yeah, a lot of options, but it, it starts on the Sunshine Tour where I'm now, and I've already had a good season, and I'm obviously just, my main focus is try to finish off as best I can so that I have those opportunities to go. I did go to Asian Tour, but that I was from Stage 1, and uh, got through Stage 1 and played Stage 2 and missed out on the final cut. Um, big learning curve, although I wasn't overseas before that. And yeah, again, South African golf is up to standard. Um, the depths could maybe be a little bit better overseas, but no, I think we've got something good going here. 
just trying to open up some doors to at least give you the opportunity to play. And both tours you just mentioned, yeah, we ten percent roughly um, of the the ten percent of the field. Mm. But we always forget out of one hundred and twenty-seven thousand golfers, if you add ladies golfers, I think it takes us up to. I think we're on like two forty. I thought that. Registered. I thought that it has to be. So mm. it's one hundred and twenty-seven, one hundred and twenty-nine thousand, one hundred and eighteen golfers, thousand golfers. That's registered. registered. On the handicap and stuff. Yeah, and I mean the handicap and the club. So they've mm. got club affiliation. Mm. So I'm sure there's They're still more. programs that that have like you maybe not with a club, you know. And I think you're right, 100 percent right. I think that's another hundred thousand roughly. And then all the players that aren't handicapped like us. Co were, were correct. Players, but these mm -hmm. are actually the viewers that you really have because if you think about this. If you if you fall into a different category, you might not be so passionate to watch the Sunshine Tour for four days in the week, you know, when the guys are actually playing. Mm. So I think this is your audience. And if you look at that in relation to other countries and then where you position where we sit, we are phenomenal in our statistics um, at what we do. So it's definitely encouraging for a lot of golfers that it most certainly is possible, even out of a small pool. Because like somebody said the other, it's the value of players that mm. we have that are really exceptional. Yeah, and these platforms, you know, you get to know people a bit better. Yeah. Gives you more, I don't know, perspective. Yeah. Mm. That it's all only just a game. Everyone's normal out there. Everyone is normal out there. Yeah. It's just humans. So I'll finish off with this, if you don't mind, Louis. The mm. best advice you've ever had? I think get a good set of value systems and live by that. I think that will take care of most of I think that will take care of most, most of, of it. If you just have a good value system and and follow that. Follow that. Help you make decisions. Help you how you interact with other people, how you interact with sponsors, how you interact with family, how you present yourself on a golf course. Um, if you do make a lot of money or the other way around, it will still carry you through those good and bad times. I think that's probably about the main one, I think, yeah. Arthi, anything from your side? No, I think from my side, Louis, thanks for being here. Yeah, I um, like this, just quickly, I like the fact that we're all wearing titles caps. Mm. Yeah, I, I tell you what, it is certainly strategic. Um, that's my longest sponsor I've had. By yeah, me. and we did it out of love this morning okay. as well. We also have, obviously, have, as they've been two, we've had two people from Titleist or Kushnet come onto the yeah. show. So we have a very strong relationship with them here. Um, nothing official yet. Mm. Um, but, we wanted to wear the caps. One, it's a very brand. It's all I think all close to our hearts. It's always been an aspirational brand for most people growing up. And in they golf. are really amazing in, in South Africa. Yeah, they, absolutely. Yeah, you know, for a small community, they make a lot of effort. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I, I'm speaking from a professional point of view, which they they are amazing. And then, I mean, they support the tour players like, so badly, hands much. down. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would really like to see other brands. I know there are some other brands in the background sponsoring a couple, a handful, you know, of players. Of course. Yeah, but... they really, and they're hands on. Leonard, you know, Leonard's been with a with a company for a long time, and he's obviously very high up. And even then, he doesn't get someone else. He's still there, hands on. You know, interacts with the people. Make sure you find. I don't know. Yeah, we're very very fortunate, especially me be with them and yeah can't thank them enough actually you know they do a good job for the for the pros and for the tour and they give back like tenfold incredible yeah and look at the off their presence also in the country you know they don't work out of uh, some small little mm. office somewhere i mean their commitment to the south african golf market which we know is by certainly no defaults could be a, a massive market for them there's obviously big markets across the world for them so for them to invest so much into South Africa, we really all appreciate that heavily. Yeah. Um, and just on Leonard, I was on a flight back from Bloemfontein once with him, and it's been, you know, you know, it takes a lot of energy to go through those four or five days, you know, on the tour. So <laughs> so he was flying back, and, and, and I just looked, and he started speaking, you know, about the players and the support. And at some stage, I looked at him, I was like, Leonard, I can't physically gain the energy to talk any longer about the game of golf tonight on this plane. But you, for the next half an hour, he was just, and I was just like, that's incredible. It, it almost attracts you, you know, like you just want to get more involved and see where you can assist. It's a love of a game through a different perspective. Completely. A different job. Um, 
Tato. Oh, and he, he also started on tour. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He's actually, yeah. Uh, even now, he's still pretty decent. Mm. Like, Shames. He's, he's, he's pretty good. And he was on tour for quite a few years. Yeah. Mm. So, Leonard, thank you for everything that you yeah. do. And you know, Rudy. And Rudy. No, of um, course. Um, you know, and the support team, it's not just, and it's a different driving range. It's, they don't always just put their names to the best and the, you know, everybody that's in fame or, or anybody that gets TV time, their behind the scenes development that they don't always get credit for is also just incredible. No, for sure. So thank you very much, Louis, for today. We appreciate it so much. Um, I really enjoyed this one. I think there was some information that came out of you today, which we've never talked about. So yeah, it's going to be really speaker, interesting. But I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to broaden my eyes a little bit. Yeah, I think we, we extracted. We're preparing you for one of those big speeches you're going to have to make. Correct. Well, the first one's coming at my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we well, go. Well, there we go. You know, if it goes well, you better say it because it started, yeah. yeah if I can do that, I probably can do anything. Just <clears throat> advice from me. Just don't drink too much before your speech. <laughs> because if you have something in front of you and you can't really focus, focus on what you're reading, it's gonna get tough. Rather, you can have a beer or two. I'm yeah, sure you can handle your be uh, your booze, but do not hit the brana vein <laughs> before your speech, <laughs> please. I've seen it many a times where the best man has a speech and then he just loses the plot. Shame. I think my brother's stressing more than I am for his speech. Oh, is it? Yeah, he's been talking about it since probably the day we got engaged. Then he knows it's coming. I'll also tell you, this is a bit off topic now, I know we have, but yes, I was nervous as hell for my speech. But like I can, my leg was going like this the whole time and Raylan was like, just, just stop moving. I'm like, I can't help it. I didn't even want to eat before my speech, but it was, listen, can I tell you something? Once, once you're up there, yeah, yeah. you savor that yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, everybody loves you there anyway. It's, yeah, no one cares if you're good or bad exactly. you know like everyone's there for you yeah uh, so and they, like I, I, yeah i've spoken once or twice but it's hard it's, it's not easy like you have to control your breathing otherwise like you remember, run out of breath and then you're like, trying to look down at your speech and then you're like everyone's staring at you i think it like gets a bit mm. overwhelming sometimes I, I think like like you say the speeches is a little bit late in the evening so there's a one or dope that gives you a little bit of courage for me it was the moment i saw my wife. Mm, I cried like a that, baby. That, you know, I thought to myself, I'll be a smooth cat on this one. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> but like I remember my mate said, she's here. And I turned and that was it. I, mm. I mean, the photos that came out of that was the ugliest photos. I was like, why would you snap me on a moment like that? But that's, uh, you know, I think all men crumble a bit when she comes around the corner. Because I think that's one. And then the second one's when that uh, first child's born. I oh, I can and tell you now. Those two, those two points in your life, I think, are just you, you know, in God's hands. Those for are sure, Lily, For sure. For sure. And, you know, it's it's amazing. I see all, almost all the Instagram, so many people on tour. And not that that, you know, for us is a, any, but a lot of faith. People have a lot mm. of faith on this tour. A lot of people... Um, I think you know, it's great. I think pray about their yeah. game. Your value systems and your, um, yeah, and your faith for sure gets you through some dark times. Um, I think lots of players, you know, struggle with some of the basics and then tend to stop golf because it, it gets tough. Um, yeah. But yeah, as I said, I think if your value systems, your belief and your circle, you know, can take you pretty much anywhere you want to go. For sure. Well, we wish you all the best, Louis. Yeah, thanks, um, you've thanks. definitely got fans here sitting in front of you, and um, I've got no doubt that the consumers or the amateurs and the professionals and the people within the golf industry, which we are very fortunate to have following us, will re is really going to enjoy this. We wish you all the best for this year, and we'll thanks keep so a much. close eye on you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Arthur. Pleasure. Thanks, sir, Louis. Thanks, sir, Arthur. Thanks, Arthur. Appreciate your time. On the next episode of The Human Golf Show. I'm on the Players Committee. I don't know if you guys know that. We so know, yes. Uh, it's been really, really enjoyable being a part of that. Now I get to see a little bit more than just the average player, what the ins and outs are, what the tournament schedule is going to look like going forward. And, you know, Thomas and Selwyn and everyone involved with the Sunshine Tour, they do a great job.